Okay. And so it is my uh, distinct honor and pleasure to introduce uh, today's world speaker, Dr. Nicole Joseph from Vanderbilt University. Uh, Dr. Joseph is actually, as you might have already heard, uh, a UW alum, uh, getting her PhD in curriculum and instruction from uh, UW in 2011. Uh, after that, she moved on to the University of Denver as an assistant professor before moving to Vanderbilt in 2016, where she is now an associate professor and also the associate dean of uh, Peabody Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion since, uh, uh, since this year, I guess. Yeah. Um, her CV lists about a whole page of awards. Um, so most recently, uh, the 2023 Louis K. Award for contributions to math education uh, by the Association for Women in Mathematics. Uh, she is the author on, uh, of very many research uh, articles and three books. And today we will hear about the, at least partial contents of one of these, uh, Making Black Girls Count in Math Education. Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Joseph. Thank you. So anyone that was on the committee that made the decision to choose me to invite me to come, Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. So the title today is if we can get it right for black girls, we can get it right for every student. Um, exploring black girls experiences in uh, mathematics learning. So I think it's important for you all to know just a little bit more about who I am, why I do this work. Why am I the right person to do this work? Um, but I borrow language from Tamara Butler, who talks about a black girl cartographer, um, which means that I care deeply about what happens um, to black girls um, and advocating for their health, for their lives. And I want to think about that specifically in mathematics, teaching and learning spaces. Um, I am definitely a critical scholar. Um, I'm an activist. I consider myself an activist. Um, I also identify as a, a, a pedagogue. And so I really think about what does it mean to learn? Um, what does it mean to create powerful learning experiences? And um, I also have, uh, I taught in here in Seattle and in federal way. So I'm a former math teacher, upper elementary, middle school math teacher and um, served as a math coach um, in federal way. And so um, I have been committed to thinking about black girls for, I don't know, nine years now. Um, and there is a sense of urgency for me and I'm very committed to this work and I'm calling for a campaign for anyone who will listen um, to join me um, in this work of creating a different experience, creating a different type of discourse um, in the field for Black girls. The, these are pictures of Black women mathematicians that have inspired my work. Some of them are alive, some of them are deceased. Does anybody recognize anyone? Who y'all recognize? Yes. Yes, she is. Anyone else recognize? Yes. Yeah. So these women, some of them I've met and have talked to and um, been inspired by, and some of them I have not, but I have written about them. So Dr. Euphemia Haynes, she was in fact the first Black woman in the United States to earn um, her PhD in mathematics. That happened in 1943, which is really not that far long ago. Um, and she went to Catholic University. So I wrote a paper that talks about the first five black women to earn PhDs in mathematics. Um, and that paper is called What Plato Took for Granted and then some long ass title, cause you know, academics, we gotta have long titles. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, you can read it. But essentially that paper talks about their lives, both the um, challenges of getting a doctorate during Jim Crow um, in mathematics, uh, but also like the possibilities 
Um, I have a nice table that showed like uh, research projects, funding that they got or didn't get. Um, and um, the reason why I titled it what Plato took for granted was because I was trying to like think about philosophical, philosophically um, kind of how we position what <clears throat> what um, mathematicians are. So like, you know, abstract and like all of these other things that we've socially constructed is what a mathematician does and how their lives really embodied um, um, those things as well as other what I call like transformative um, experiences. So this last picture was from uh, the um, research conference from the Association for Women in Mathematics. I just did a talk. I was one of their plenaries uh, two, three weeks ago, something like that. So these black women in the corner um, are math professors at Clark Atlanta University, which is in Georgia. So I'd like to, because I'm a pedagogue, <clears throat> I'd like for us to explore our own math stories. I want you to take a minute to think about your own K-12 math education. And I want you to make a short list and really you can just think of one thing. What were some of those experiences that contributed to you actually recognizing yourself as a strong math student? What were, or if there were any negative experiences that made you doubt your ability in mathematics? And so um, you could just turn to your neighbor and you can talk about that. I'm only going to give you like a minute or two. But what were some of the things that helped you to recognize yourself as somebody that was a strong math student? And then if there were any negative things. Okay, one, two, three, go. I love your class. So I'd love to hear at least one or two answers about positive things that you recognize yourself. Yes. In fourth grade, uh, I did an internship between choir and uh, teaching calculus. And my calculus teacher before that, I had had me type put me through here. And he was like, Ellie, I trust you can learn the materials, bring all the homework, go to quizzes, you can go to choir. You, I, I mean, and that having that trust placed in me. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wasn't worried one bit whether you could do the work. Yeah. Someone else on this side of the room. Yes. Also, a uh, twelfth grade uh, AP calculus test. Um, growing up, like all through K, K through eleven, I was like, okay, I'm like kind of okay on math. I definitely recognize the. 
Why did you feel like they were better than you? Just curious. Um, because I feel like I felt like they could answer questions in a sense that they were able to go back to mm. or like I hear a better question and ask it that way. Which know. now you know is foolishness, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. That's right. I remember I was uh, we were doing like a practice and test. Mm -hmm. And I remember speaking on a Saturday and I was like, I remember it was so hard. But I just kind of like went with it and kept on it. And so it's like a written test where they had to like try to write down like the things that I would say and why it was like the best to talk to yep. I got a four on it, and I felt like pretty okay with that because it was like pretty good. But then the teachers were like, "Oh, if you got a four on this, then you should be like really happy because that has like the percentage of your grade that it brings you to like the top of your grade." And I remember thinking, "Oh, you know what? I'm like kind of okay at this. I don't think this is where I got like a bad grade." Yeah. So seeing you for as a competent individual, um, and reassuring you. Yeah, nice. Okay, let's go to the negative side. Yes, the lady with the fly glasses. Uh, here in elementary school, uh, everyone knows that boys are just better than that much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Uh, in high school, I'm going to introduce myself to the teachers because the teachers were just really nice and nice with us. Mm -hmm. And I went to the school with two or eight black guys, not knowing what it was. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So lots of go ahead. I'm gonna let you because you've been my girl all day. So go ahead, Kate. I was just gonna say that a lot of my experiences that I negative have to do with self improvement about my own abilities in mathematics, where I'm agreeing myself to be comparing myself to other people because I always felt like growing up like I wasn't the best in the room, that like I wasn't good at it. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like throughout my time that like a lot of the negative a lot of times that I doubt myself is because I'm doubting myself and mm -hmm. not necessarily because other Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I asked you that question because I study math identities and I study math identities and how they get developed or not developed specifically in black girls. So these are constructs that have been shown in prior validated surveys of math identity um, that these are the things that directly and indirectly shape mathematics identity. So when we pulled this and ran the numbers, it was not working as well for the black women that are, were a part of that large data set. This was the um, one uh, subconstruct that had a significant, like very strong relationship to math identity for black girls, recognition. So this is why I asked you um, about um, what were some things that helped you to recognize and see yourself um, as a strong math student? Okay. Why focus on black girls? I'm gonna talk about three things. Um, with each of these three things, I'm gonna give some examples from the literature um, to sort of illustrate the example. We all know probably that there's severe underrepresentation that goes from kindergarten all the way to the PhD and honestly into the workforce. Uh, limited opportunities to learn. Uh, there are teachers, math teachers, teachers in general that uh, internalize stereotypes about black women, uh, uh, excuse me, black girls. And so when that happens, they teach accordingly. So if they don't look at a black girl and can see a future mathematician, but they see someone who is off task all the time, you know, or too loud or whatever, they're going to teach accordingly, right? Number three, they are the leading group in the school to prison pipeline context. All right, just take a look at this data. This is um, the most recent data that we have, even though it's old as hell. Um, this shows the percentage of black girls in K-12 mathematics courses across, you know, all of the courses that we usually see in high school. Um, this was from the high school longitudinal study data sets. And just take a look 
and um, see what you notice. I learned about noticing from you, Doug, <laughs> from our department. What do you notice? <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are so many high schools in our country that don't even offer advanced math classes, especially in schools where you see a high population of minoritized students. Um, you can look up, there have been actual court cases. I think I shared this earlier with one of the groups by the way, it's been a fantastic day. I had a great breakfast. The women with uh, Stan, how you doing? And uh, it's been a great day. But um, yeah, there have been court cases where students have been trying to get advanced classes at their high school. That doesn't seem like a really hard thing. You find a teacher and you start implementing the course. But um, they've been um, denied and um, don't even have the option of taking uh, advanced math classes. All right, let's keep going. This is breaking down associate degrees in mathematics, bachelor's degrees in mathematics, master's in mathematics, and PhDs. Um, this is from the National Science Foundation Women and Minorities Report. Um, and uh, from 2019, there might be one more recent one, but the numbers are pretty dismal still stays the same about so what's something that you notice yes mm -hmm. yep um in 2017 there were like four black women who came out with phds i think i know three of them So the underrepresentation is significant. This is some very recent work by um, a student at Vanderbilt who came to us with a PhD in mathematics and decided that they wanted to have conversations about equity because they weren't able to have those conversations at the institution that they were at. Um, this is Taylor McNeil. Um, my colleague, Luis Leva, this is uh, his student. So Taylor interviewed several black women, uh, mathematicians, and tried to better understand their experiences. And this is a paper that is coming out in JRME, Journal of Research in Mathematics Education, Prove Yourself Exploring Epistemological Values in Mathematics Department Support and Oppression of Black Women Faculty. So I pulled this up because even black women who have the math chops are, you know, are still getting their intelligence questioned. Do you belong in a math department? Do you belong in mathematics? So what is going on? It's like one thing to say, oh, they don't have the prerequisites you know, from high school or whatever. Oh, they're just not prepared. Oh, they just don't, you know, they don't come from a family that values education. Well, what about these women? I mean, they graduated from elite institutions, have won awards, published. Some of them are full professors. So what is the problem? Why are people still continuing to question the intelligence of black women, specifically in mathematics? When you figure that answer out, call me. But I put this up here so that you can see K-12 is really, oh, by the way, I do a lot of cussing. I'm just gonna tell you that. So K-12 is really messed up, right? How can I even get 
black girls to want to major in mathematics at the undergraduate level if they're having such negative experiences in K-12? Well, let's just say I can get you a hundred. Then when you come to a math department in at the higher ed level, you still have colleagues. I mean, I mean, no, excuse me. You still have um, uh, environments that are exclusionary. It's not welcoming. It's chilly. Nobody wants to study with you. Like it's still there. But somehow you still make it and you graduate with your bachelor's degree and then you decide you want to get a Ph.D. Right. So then you go and you get a Ph.D. And basically all the things that you experienced as an undergraduate have now, you know, become exponential in terms of your experience. So I want you to be thinking about that. Like this is a phenomenon that I'm trying to understand and study and address. And this is why I'm calling for the campaign for everybody to think about these things. How do we change this? How do we change this? Okay. Limited opportunities. So this is a study um, that came out of 2017. There have since been three additional studies that were put out by the Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality. So in this particular study, because now we're talking about stereotypes. Um, they went and interviewed regular Americans walking down the street. You know, this wasn't in any particular, you know, uh, special group of people. The sample was small, but they basically asked people these questions about black girls and they wanted to compare them to white girls. And um, these were some of the findings, these, these six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things were the findings compared to white girls of the same age server survey participants perceived. So these are stereotypes. So, um, black girls need less nurturing. Black girls need less protection. Black girls need to be supported less like for real. Black girls need to be comforted less. Black girls are more independent. Black girls know more adult topics. Black girls know more about sex. So this was a small sample, but this is still showing evidence of people, how people perceive black girls. And so they introduced this concept called adultification bias. So I'm sure you guys have heard about adultification, um, but That is how um, one of the types of stereotypes that black girls face in schools um, and in society is that they are adultified. Why does this matter in math? So this is just the graph to show that um, these thoughts begin to, People had these perceptions beginning with kids as young as eight, black girls as young as age five, which is probably why um, we've seen some of these cases. Um, Raise your hand if you know about this case about the first grade, first grade black girl who was berated while they were doing math class. Because there's just this like expectation that she is supposed to know because they are adultifying her. So I might need a little help. Let me see if I can get the video together. Here we go. The one you. You cut her. Great students. Take a look. Published a disturbing video featuring a charter school teacher in New York berating one of her first grade students. Take a look. That's the one you, you cut or you split. So count it again, making sure you're counting correctly. Go to the calm down chair and sit. There's nothing that infuriates me more than when you don't do what's on your paper. Somebody come up and show me how she should have counted 
to get her answer that was one in a split. Show my friends and teach them. One in a split. Thank you. Do not go back to your seat and show me one thing and then don't do it here. You're confusing everybody. Very upset and very disappointed. Jesus. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, uh, reactions and thoughts on this. Yeah. She did not get fired. She still works there. I think there was like a little bit of like administrative leave or something like that, but she did not get fired. Mm -hmm. What's the, yeah. Yeah. She's also like six. <laughs> and I think adultification bias is at least a part of the explanation around why she did what she did. Now, that is an actual practice in that school. It's called rip and redo. That's like a practice that all of the teachers in the school do. But you can imagine having your paper, you know, ripped in front of you. You're embarrassed, um, you know, because apparently you didn't count the split right or whatever. And then you're forced to go sit at the naughty chair or whatever the chair was, right? So these are just some of the experiences that very young Black girls are having in our schools. And so do you think that teacher was looking at that young lady saying, this is a future physicist, this is a future engineer? No. You know, she was trying to control her body and uh, basically erase her intellect. And then, you know, the way that they were engaging in math, you know, just didn't, it just seemed scary. Like it wasn't even welcoming or anything like that. But those are some of the experiences that the um, that black girls are having. All right, leading group to the school to prison pipeline. So let me get four people read the, to read these so I can have more audience participation. So you don't have to raise your hand, just read one of the bullets. So these statistics are from this paper, um, Let Her Learn, Stopping School Pushout for Girls of Color, that the National Women's um, Law Center um, published. And, you know, when I read these, when I read this report, I literally wept um, because it just, especially this preschool, I mean, all of it's terrible, but the preschool situation where half of them are being suspended from preschool. And I'm thinking you're like, two, three, four, five, right? In preschool. What in the world is happening, right? Um, and then you can see that there are particular states that have very large percentages of black girls um, that are being suspended. So they are leading um, any race or gender of students. So that includes black boys. Um, and this is astounding. Um, and this is, you know, critical. And this is another reason why we need to pay attention. So there's a lot of sort of like research. Yes. For the second bullet, does that, I mean, uh, but it said it was more for more of our parents because of data or because they're working those days? Because of data. 
Mm-hmm. Um, there's sort of a confluence, if you will, of research and you know philanthropy and people starting to really think about this. Um, and this is just a couple of organizations that I chose to amplify. Black Girls Freedom Fund um, is one of those. So people are starting to really think, we need to start paying attention to what's happening to Black girls and women. Um, and we need to start putting resources, financial resources into this space because um, the outcomes are horrific. So a Black woman with the same level of education, the same level of experiences still makes 46 cents to the dollar for a white male that has the exact same. 46 cents. Um, So African American Policy Forum, you guys may have heard the name Kimberly Crenshaw. She's like a huge theorist um, and um, talks about intersectionality. Um, Her policy forum has done a lot of work around research and uh, Black girls. Goldman Sachs has dedicated a billion dollars to better understand and um, directly input into Black women's lives from healthcare, education, um, all of those things. And you should look these things up because these things are happening, which is positive. Um, And I'm trying to get funding from some of these folks. Um, So today I really want to, you know, elevate what is black girlhood? What is, what have, what have I learned about what that is? Um, and what does that look like in a math classroom? How does that show up? So I'm hoping that people will listen, that they will reflect, that they will ask questions. And at the end of the day, that they will act. So black girlhood, this is from this book, here are truths, the creative potential of black girlhood. Um, this quote says black girlhood is freedom and Black girls are free. As an organizing construct, Black girlhood makes possible the affirmation of Black girls' lives, and if necessary, their liberation. Black girlhood as a spatial intervention is useful for making our daily lives better and therefore changing the world as we currently know it. So Black girlhood really is about freedom dreaming, a different type of... um, Re, a reimagining, if you will, because what we have now is the imagination of someone years and years and years and years and years ago that did not even believe that Black girls were even human. So we have to, Black girlhood studies, it's a whole body of literature, it's a field of study. Um, they are saying that this is like a freedom dreaming of something different that is specifically around things like liberation and joy. Here's some of the places that you can learn about Black girlhood. You're not going to find anything if you're reading in math, Jeremy, math ed literature, for example. You're not going to really learn about Black girlhood specifically. So I've spent years reading outside of my field to better understand what is Black girlhood, um, um, how do they conceptualize it, how do they think about it. Uh, One of my favorite books is Cultivating Joyful Learning Experience, Learning Spaces for Black Girls, Insights into Interrupting School Pushout. Um, But these are just a couple. There's like a ton um, to learn about um, Black girlhood. So the educational problem, you know, that I study is, uh, or excuse me, the educational problem that I think about Part of that question I want to walk through with us is what do we already know? What do we know about Black girls in math learning? And more importantly, what can we do? So people have studied this problem. um, uh, And so they really haven't studied this problem. But for folks who have studied this problem, they've studied it through um, like a single axis. So they either look through race or they look through gender. But nobody was really studying at the intersection, which is how I earned tenure, basically, is I said, let's think about this through an intersectional lens to try to theorize what might be happening for black girls uh, in math 
learning. Um, and so one of those important papers was the one toward an understanding of intersectionality methodology, a 30 year literature synthesis of black girls experiences. Um, this is one of the main top journals. In, uh, we worked our asses off. So yep, I'm about to take all credit <laughs> for this paper. But um, in that paper, we were learning about what does it mean to do intersectional research? What does it mean to say that you are engaging intersectionality as a theoretical construct in your work? And we've been thinking about this for years and it's challenging, it's hard. So we tried our best to sort of construct features of what intersectional research is and what does that look like? And so I am arguing that if you want to study black girls and math learning, that it needs to be through an intersectional lens. Um, and there's not a lot of research out there. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about three sort of findings. Um, the US math education system does not love black girls. It is intentionally designed to erase and dehumanize them. Um, and so these are some examples of what I mean by erasure. We've got research that, that shows that math and science teachers call black girls too loud, too talkative. They police what they wear, what, what they're doing. Um, there's research where we have teachers and counselors that are not encouraging black girls to engage, to, to major in math and science, but are saying, oh, you're more social. You need to maybe think about this type of major. Um, that constant comparison to white girls, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then they are seldom recommending black girls for gifted programming. And so clearly these experiences contribute to their fragmentation of their identities um, and their push out of mathematics. It's being, they are being pushed out of mathematics. It is not about their preparation it is not about whether they can do it or not. They are being pushed out. Okay, so this was a study, um, school as a hostile institution, how black and immigrant girls of color experience the classroom. So basically we have these two black girls, um, um, Eliza and I'm sorry, um, Stella. No, 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 this is about Eliza, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Rachel Ray, the, the, the researcher, basically asked the teacher, so what do you think about, you know, um, the girls, Eliza going to the next level? Eliza was doing well. Um, and I think she was just some, trying to figure out, are you going to recommend her for like the next high level math class? And this is, <laughs> this is what the teacher said. Well, the thing is, Eliza works a lot like spring. She just has this knack for reading. She is continuously reading and her mom doesn't care for her and grandma is her everything, but she has a love for it. Eliza is more like does the work. And same with math. She religiously does her work. So like the researcher is like, I don't really understand. Like what, what, what's the, what's the difference here? And pressed the teacher to say more. And she said, well, spring, We'll do extra reading. Eliza, and Eliza, she reads what's assigned. And well, she will read extra, but not like out of a love for reading as a discipline. <laughs> also, maybe it's because Eliza is responsible for her sisters. But like that she's at the top is kind of like fake. I don't mean fake, but like imposed, you know? So this teacher basically is erasing this young black girl's intellect and constantly comparing her to this spring as a white girl, constantly comparing her to spring. So it's like, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Like you want me to participate, I'm participating, but somehow that's not enough because it doesn't look like this white girl. So like, what do you do with that, right? What do y'all think? Let me get a comment. Somebody who we haven't heard from. Isn't this like insane? Yeah. What you think? What you think? 
Yeah, what do you think? Yeah. Now, this gentleman right here. I mean, I think he's not going to volunteer in the future to help me recognize the whole thing. Hell yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, these are, you know, these are real experiences with real black girls that are happening. Um, I'm going to keep going. Here's the second um, finding. The U.S. math education system, and I'm talking about the entire system, culture, community discourses, policies, all of it, is structurally exclusionary. It is oppressive. And it upholds gendered anti-blackness, white supremacy, and whiteness. Um, pre and in-service teachers and higher education faculty, they don't have any structural incentive to engage in this work critically, right? To examine these issues and to think about how um, they relate to instructors teaching practices um, and black girls learning outcomes. Professional development in the K-12 system, ain't no professional development in the K-12 system to help Teachers understand these things and tenure track faculty, you can forget it because they're already protected. So why would they want to engage in these things? Now, professors of the practice, I don't know if you guys have professors of practice, of course, like lectures and sometimes postdocs and folks who are not on that system. That's usually where we find the most um that's where we have hope because there's usually, those are the, usually the folks who want to engage in these conversations. But this was a study from um, the road not taken to African-American girls' experiences with mathematics. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit uh, more detail about this study. So Stella and Rachel, these are two black girls in this study. Rachel was in the advanced math class. Rachel was in the regular class. And they had Miss Oliver who was their white um, math teacher. And Miss Oliver was known in the whole county as like a strong math, student, math teacher. Um, she was respected by students. And so, you know, this was supposedly a great teacher, right? For all students. Well, Miss Oliver was really unimpressed with students who she felt were apathetic. She actually viewed Rachel and Stella as being apathetic. She asserted that these unambitious students were from families with little parental support. Though Stella was a hardworking, meticulous math student who was also full of personality and loved to sing, went around families and friends. Stella worked hard to seek Miss Oliver's approval. So when we look through Black girl specificity, Stella was making intentional decisions to navigate Miss Oliver and her math class. She was clear that um, her way of being in math class was really not acceptable. So what she did is she like adopted this really quiet and sweet girl type of um, identity. Um, and she was constantly monitoring her behaviors. So it appeared that Stella understood that her identities were not welcome, right? So Ms. Oliver, uh, I'm sorry, adopting an identity that was not authentic came at a cost because guess what the teacher did, y'all? So Stella's um, favorable view of Ms. Oliver, um, basically the teacher did not recommend her for the next level math class. Um, even though her grades, her test scores were comparable to all any of the white students that were in her class, the teacher chose not to recommend her for the program. And she got the chops and doing everything else, showing that, you know, the traditional metrics that people are looking for, she's doing it. And the teacher still did not recommend her. So what is happening? What is going on there? Right. This is real. So I always like to tell people because people get all nervous when they see the word white supremacy or whiteness. It's a whole field of study. You have people who study white supremacy and whiteness specifically like in educational context. So we're not talking about Ku Klux Klan and that kind of stuff. But we are talking about the everyday decisions that teachers, administrators, faculty 
people that are in power make that basically um, reinforce like the status quo. So I um, wanted you to, uh, I wanted to take you to this website called White Supremacy uh, Culture Characteristics. There are 14, I didn't write all 14 there. Um, but I want, wanted you to see this website because they talk, they give um, a very nice understanding of what this is, right? And, um, oh, this is the wrong one. It's here. Whoops. This is a system of domination that we see in mathematics um, every day. And my colleague, Dr. Luis Leva, actually studies higher ed specifically. Um, and I would encourage you to read some of his papers because um, he has talked about the ways in which mathematics is a white institutional space. So these are some of the characteristics. And I want you to think about like your own experience. So objectivity is a white supremacy culture uh, characteristic. Worship of the written word. Come on now, we got to write proofs, right? To give evidence that this particular thing is true, right? We have archival data. Um, it has to be written down in order for us to know that it actually happened, right? Either or thinking individualism. Yeah, I was learning today from the graduate students that the undergraduate math program like is so super competitive that people don't want to work together because they're trying to make sure that they make it on their own. Uh, power hoarding. Um, right to comfort, uh, paternalism, sense of urgency, defensiveness. These are all white supremacy characteristics. What I love about this is that they also give antidotes. What can you do to disrupt these characteristics? Um, and so I would, I'm not going to stay here long. I would encourage you to go back and look um, at this information. Um, these are uh, scholars, Timu, I forget the other person. Um, There we go. Timu Oaken. I never remember the last name. Um, but these are white scholars who have been studying these things. And so they have packaged it for, you know, sort of regular everyday people to kind of understand what this is. And so I just think that it's a very powerful way to kind of help people understand um, what I mean when I say that mathematics is embedded in um white supremacy culture. And you can, I can give you some like real examples. I've talked to a lot of math departments, done a lot of talks across the country in math departments. And I say, well, let's just, let's just take a walk down the hall. What do the walls say? Who's on the walls? What's the story? The walls are speaking to your students and you every time they walk down this hallway to go to class. What is it saying? So this is when mouths drop because they know that what's on there are just white males. Um, and that's when they discover and be like, wow. And then I say, okay, well, let's talk about the textbooks. Who's writing those textbooks? Whose values? Whose mathematics? Like, let's just get real, right? And so it's a system of domination that is in everything, the curriculum, the uh, pathway, like, you know, you have to have this certain scope and sequence, this type of pathway in order to be prepared to apply to selective universities, right? All of that is embedded in white supremacy culture characteristics because it reflects basically white interests and no one else's, right? Um, so those are things to think about. Okay, the last one that I wanna talk about is Black girls seldom have access to high quality mathematics teachers, a liberatory curriculum, transformative instruction. Um, and these are just a few examples. Yes, 
Sorry, Siri. <laughs> um, of papers that I'll just um, highlight. This is one that I wrote. This was basically, I call this my signature paper. I wrote a literature review to understand what have people been studying about Black girls way back in 2017 um, to see what was out there and what were those um, sort of factors that would support Black girls' uh, math learning. So the second one was the Francis and colleagues. So they asked 268 school counselors to evaluate student transcripts that were identical except for the name on the profile and to decide whether to recommend that student for AP Calc, okay? Um, so like some of the transcripts names were Deja Jackson, that's like a black female. Andre Washington, that was a black male. Hannah Douglas was a white female. Jake Connor was a white male. 86% of the counselors were women. Um, they found that the black female transcript was the least likely to be recommended for the AP calculus. And it also had the lowest preparation score. So they had to score to say, are they prepared? So it was the black female sounding name on those transcripts. And then the last study, um, kind of similar to Francis and colleagues, um, they used a randomized control study. There was like 390 folks in that study to um, examine students' mathematical abilities. They explored teachers' evaluation of like 18 mathematical solutions to problems. Um, in which gender and race specific names had been randomly assigned. Their study concluded that when assessing students' math ability, biases against black, Hispanic, and white females were revealed. But the greatest bias was against black girl sounding names. What do you do with this, y'all? Like, these things are happening in our schools every single day. We are not getting black girls talent. We are pushing them out of mathematics because we have people who are gatekeepers um, and are creating, um, you know, making decisions that are impacting these black girls' lives. So then they don't get an opportunity to engage in math and STEM, and I'm just a believer that black women have the answers to some of our most naughty problems in the world, from climate change, but they won't ever get a chance to be at those tables to make these decisions, to have those discussions because of these types of things that are happening in the K-12 system, never mind once they get to higher ed, right? All right, so what can we do? about this. I designed this working framework. That's the um, paper that I published. Essentially, I, I tried to take the things that I was learning, um, both from my own research as well as the research of others, to develop what I call the Black Feminist Math Pedagogies framework. It's a working framework because things might change, right? But these are some of the pieces of um, this framework. So um, ambitious math instruction, engage black girls in argumentation, reasoning, modeling. Do you know when I talk to black girls, they tell me all they do are worksheets. Worksheets. Now there's nothing wrong with a worksheet in and of itself, but when that is the main way that you are engaging in mathematical ideas, that's a problem, right? They don't really get to engage in what the math ed field has found around ambitious instruction, which is where you get to problem pose. You get to use technology to uh, model mathematical ideas where you get to solve interesting problems. That's not their experience in like most urban schools across this country, right? Um, critical consciousness is a, 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 re a really important like theoretical piece for me is that like, how do we engage black girls in mathematics that helps to elevate 
their consciousness about inequality in the world um, or in their lives and their communities, things that they find important. And then um, this academic social integration, they're like, why do we have to sit in rows? Why can't we engage in math and crack a joke and talk to our friends? Why can't we listen to music while we are working on our math? Because that's generally not allowed in most math classes. And you're viewed as not being serious. You're viewed as um, <clears throat> not focused. All of these things that have been socially constructed around who is a good math student. A good math student does A, B, C, D, and E. So if a black girl is not in alignment or map doesn't map onto that, then she's a problem, right? But whose imagination and representation does this, you know, uh, uh, represent? You're generally white middle class students, right? So there's this um, constant uh, not viewing black girls. So I'm like, okay, let's think about how can we better support them? So people say, well, isn't um, good teaching just good teaching? Ambitious math instruction would be good teaching for black girls. You could just do that and I bet you'd see some progress. But if you wanna get to transformative teaching, then you need to think about these other three things. Critical consciousness, robust academic identities, and academic and social integration. So this is um, in the book. I have been, you know, I've talked to math teachers about that. Um, and these last couple of slides, uh, last year I gave a talk to the National Academy of Sciences and um, I just said, let's just get right down to the tax. You know, what do black girls need? So what I tried to do was I borrowed this sort of categorization from my colleague, Luis Leva, where he talks about structural uh, factors, interpersonal structures, uh, factors, and more ideological so that people can say, okay, maybe we can work on this thing or, you know, maybe we can work on that. So we need money to really establish um, supports for projects that focus on what is happening with Black girls in mathematics specifically. So I'm like one of maybe, I don't know, four scholars across the country that study black girls specifically in mathematics, not STEM, but math, right? Um, they need to have critically conscious math instructors who understand what has been happening with them, the push out, the ways in which, you know, math departments operate, all those things. Um, and they need to, um, relinquish some of that power and think about different types of curriculum that's more interesting, more challenging, all those things, right? Um, black girls also need school systems and people who work in them to treat them with dignity, understanding that they are complex individuals. They deserve to bring their full set of emotions and their full set of humanities, uh, personhood in a math class. It just is, that's what they should be able to do. Um, they need cultural brokers, people who understand the system and people who understand black girlhood to try to help think about how do we bridge that gap. Um, we need intersectional interventions. So um, I just recently donated to a school um, several thousand dollars because this particular school is basically all black and they, for the first time in 15 years, got off of the, what do you call that list? Like when your school has been, hasn't been making AYP or whatever. What no, sorry. <laughs> so for the first time in 15 years, they got off the list. And so I took some of my grant money. It's not a federal grant for those of you that are like, what? It's not a federal grant um, and donated to the school. And I said, this needs to specifically go to creating math clubs for girls in your school. Enrichment. We're not doing, um, you know, uh, what's the other one? Remediation. We're not doing that. Let's figure out some interesting, you know, math problems. Girls get to come. 
talk about how they use math outside of school. Let's make it exciting. Um, black girls need university level math professors to reject the idea of neutrality of math learning, but understand the role that racialized and gender oppression has played in preventing uh, many black women from feeling like they belong. Y'all saw some of that research. Where do we go from here? So there's a joke about, well, what about Monday, right? So these are some things that, you know, people could start doing on Monday. Um, you know, those districts, these are the five districts that have the highest number of black girls enrolled in public schools. They literally can just do just some straight up data just to see what's happening. Are these girls in gifted ed? You know, are they taking advanced courses? Like just to get the lay of the land of what is actually happening. Um, empirical research, we do need quant research, but we need it to be critical um, to tell us and give us what is actually happening uh, with schools. We definitely need longitudinal data. I'm working on some longitudinal projects right now um, and some deep ethnographic stuff. So this is a high level, because I'm such a teacher, uh, takeaways. Why are black girls rep underrepresented? These are some pieces to the story. These systems, ideologies, policies, and practices, they're just rooted in patriarchy um, and white supremacy and anti-blackness, gendered anti-blackness. Um, what do we know? We know that these stereotypes are part of the story that they are getting in the way, that teachers are internalizing these things and are therefore um, teaching accordingly, like you saw in the video. What can we do? You can join the Black Feminist Movement with Dr. Joseph um, and better understand Black girlhood. You can reject those stereotypes. See Black girls as children. They're not adults. That's the adultification. Teach ambitiously. Give them exciting problems and projects. Um, and then this last one, create conditions that make it impossible for them to fail. That's a tall order, but that's what I'm putting out for you all to think about. Finally, I just want to say where my work is going next. So <clears throat> I recently got funded to basically try to scale um, um, this uh, scale to create my own scale, excuse me, for uh, math identity. So I, in my scale, which is called MICME, Measuring Inclusive Constructs of Math Identity, I include these things but I add additional theoretical constructs, intersectionality barriers and intersectionality assets. Um, and we also added here belonging and um, I think self-efficacy. So we co-designed this measure with black girls ages eight through 13 in a school district in Tennessee. Um, and essentially I'm trying to scale what I've seen in my smaller empirical qualitative studies to, to now validate something that um, I've seen happening in those smaller studies. So I am in the last part of that validation. People are literally calling me every month. Is the scale ready? Is the scale ready? And I learn it's so hard to do validation work. I don't know if anybody in here does validation work, but um, when you're trying to get 1500 black girls Doing opt-in is a challenge, and I learned a big lesson, uh, but I just have ethics around, like, having, like, forcing folks to do stuff, and then they have to opt out. So to be able to sleep at night, you know, I didn't choose to do that, but I'm learning a big lesson, and I'm going to have to do opt-out because I need to get my numbers, and that's what I'm working on now is to develop, <clears throat> finish validating this survey. But I'm really excited. I hope this helps to get me full professor because I literally have a list of um, researchers that want to use it, school districts ready to partner, but it ain't ready yet, y'all. So anyway, I just want to thank you for listening. I'm glad I only went over a little bit, five after. And um, yeah, do we have time for questions, Bernard? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we also have a reception over in Lewis Hall where you can have more questions. Okay. 
Yes. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you. This is really vital. Um, I was curious how you think about institutionalized education in schools in New York City versus like all the education that happens outside the school system from elders in our community, from the young people. From okay, can I just give you a fist yeah. pump? Yes. Outside learning in informal context is so significant, especially in math. But what we have seen is that that's not welcome in the classroom when you can actually utilize that as part of the curriculum, right? You can utilize it as part of an anticipatory set. You can use it as part of, to get kids excited or girls, black girls excited about the math to then help scaffold them to something a little bit more challenging. But we don't do that. We don't allow kids to talk about the ways in which they use math outside. Of, of schools. So I think it's very important. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. How, what does one have to do to get suspended from preschool? You got to be a black girl, apparently. What does one have to do to get arrested as a six year old? Because what you were saying was like a lot of it was lack of representation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, things that aren't being done, mm -hmm. but suspending like that is, yeah. I'm just shocked by it. Yeah. Taking it to an active level of suppression. Yeah. Almost. You so, can... so th there's a disconnect in my mind of, of what you were describing and shit actions that I was seeing. Yeah. How? How do I make that? I think connection? it is because people look at black girls through a particular lens. So part of that lens is they say you should know better. So you have enough tantrum and you rolling on the floor or you know whatever a four year old does. Right. And then they say because they think you are an adult and you should know better then you, that, that black girl ha, is getting punished harsher rather than come here, let me give you a hug. What's going on? Why are you cutting up in class today? Right. Or whatever. Right. No, they are being, you know, kicked out of school or whatever. Y'all look it up. You can Google it in Florida. They arrested this little girl who was like five years old. Her hands were so tiny, they couldn't put the handcuffs. It's unreal. And they use zip ties to um, put her hands together. But I think the only reason why that is allowed to happen is because of adultification. They don't see her as an innocent child. You saw that data. Black girls need less support. Black girls need, like, that is what some parts of our society, that's what they think. And I think that shows up a lot in schools. So you guys have heard of like a lot of the charter schools. <clears throat> I'm not going to name it. Yes, I am. KIPP schools. <laughs> um, it is all about controlling the bodies of black kids. So, you know, you have to walk in a line and your hand, your fingers have to be lined up with your knees and all of those things. But nobody questions it. You know why? Because 90% of those kids are passing the state assessment. But they don't think that the dehumanization is impacting who they are. Dr. Ebony McGee, another one of my colleagues, well, she left us and went to John Hopkins. We should pop her for that. But um, she has written about successful Black math students and how, you know, some of them in her study, I mean, just excellent in all the measures but they don't even recognize themselves because they have given up all of their identities, who they are to fit in this structure of, of a math department, right? So identities are being stripped all the time, fragmented all the time um, of black women and African-American students in math. Maybe one, one more, was, some, was there a hand? Yes. The number of bad things that white teachers have done 
are black teachers any better or are they something if they have yeah if they have not interrogated these systems if they don't understand black girlhood they are just as guilty and by the way there are some white teachers that have done that due diligence that have interrogated these systems that have made um significant um uh, impact, positive impact with black girls. And I have another book called Interrogating Whiteness and Relinquishing Power. In that book, there are white scholars who talk about their journey of the work that they engaged in to become critically conscious to then better support, you know, students of color. So absolutely right. Because all of us have been shaped by these systems. So if we don't interrogate the work, then we can be just as, you know, like do these horrible things and think deficit ways about black girls. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. Okay. Thank you.